Okay, so thank you for joining and welcome um, to this session on the Student Voices Campaign, Empowering Student Advocacy Through Arts Learning. Um, before, before we begin, I just wanted to make sure that everybody has signed in. There are actually two sign-in sheets. There's one that I have to give back to AME, and then um, I want to make sure that you guys have put down your contact information so I can follow up with links to all the resources that are going to be mentioned today. Um, so that's going to be here. If you haven't signed in, be sure you do before the end of the day. Um, and there are also flyers that I put in this folder and on the table for you to take and distribute and learn more. Um, so my name is Melissa Mio. I am the program assistant at the California Alliance for Arts Education. And I'm joined today by Anne von Shafford, who is the director at Arcadia Arts Institute and Innov Innovation Design Institute. Um, so today we're going to introduce the Student Voices Campaign, which is a real world opportunity for students to learn about and impact school policy making through a media arts project. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview of current school funding policy um, known as the Local Control Funding Formula, or LCFF, and the role for student advocacy within LCF, F, LCFF. Um, and then I'm going to talk about our newly released Classroom Guide, um, which is a resource for teachers to help participate in the campaign um, and help bring the campaign as a project to your classroom. Um, and then lastly, I'm going to turn it over to Anne, who has used the Student Voices campaign um, in her program and how she, she's going to talk more about how she used it to further engage student advocacy. Uh, to give a bit of background, my organization, the California Alliance for Arts Education, we're a nonprofit advocacy organization. Um, and we advocate for a high quality arts education for all California students by providing policy expertise and mobilizing a statewide network of allied partners and advocates, including students. Um, and the Student Voices Campaign is a program that we launched in 2013. It's an annual video advocacy campaign that empowers students to make their voices heard in their local school district. Um, the campaign website is studentvoicescampaign.org and that has everything, so if you take away one thing today, just make sure to go to that website. I'm gonna keep plugging it. Um, so to give a introduction, I'm gonna play this video that illustrates a little more about what the campaign is about. Um, this is also available on the Student Voices Campaign website, and it's a great tool to kind of explain policy and the campaign to students. Um, so here we go. What if I said you can change the world by making a video? And that video is about your voice, your vision, your school. It's the Student Voices Campaign. And we're looking for students just like you. So here's the story. Every school is part of a school district. In California, there are over a thousand school districts. These districts are governed by school boards, made up of people who are elected to serve and decide what's best for the students. In 2013, our state passed a law called the Local Control Funding Formula, giving these local school boards the power to decide how money should be spent in their district. And, Here's where the student voices come in. School boards are required to consult with the community before they make their decisions, including the people most connected to the school, meaning parents and students. And it's up to us to use our voices to say what will make our schools better places to learn and prepare ourselves for the rest of our lives. The California Alliance for Arts Education wants us to make short videos, like two minutes or less. And here's the question they're asking. What's your vision for your school? What ignites creativity, imagination, and passion in school? What should your school do to inspire creativity? It could be a movie about zombies, or a comedy, or a soap opera, or a documentary, 
whatever works best. Maybe it's about being in a school band, or a theater program that makes your heart sing, or a dance class, or a visual arts teacher, or one of your classmates who inspires the artist in you. Tell a story about what matters in your own life or in the lives of people you know and show what that looks like. Any student in grades 7 through 12 is eligible to submit a video. To recap, the Student Voices Campaign um, is open to all California public school students in grades 7 to 12. Um, we uh, invite them to create original short two-minute videos that show their vision for their school in education. Specifically, we want to know what inspires their creativity and passion and what would make their school a better place. Um, and then the California Alliance sends all submitted videos directly to the students' local school board members as part of the annual district planning process. Um, it's an annual campaign. It runs from November to April. So the next deadline for the 2017 campaign is coming up really fast, April 1st. Um, and then it'll launch again in November where we're open for submissions for the following school year. Um, and then all the rules, guidelines, instructions on how to submit a video and participate is at the website, studentvoicescampaign.org. Um, so to put some of this into context, I do want to talk briefly about school funding policy um, and how the annual district planning process works. I know that some of you may be teachers and may be already familiar with this, but if you could bear with me. Um, so in 2013, California passed a law called the Local Control Funding Formula, or LCFF, which dramatically changed the way schools set priorities and are funded. Um, so that eliminated, like almost entirely eliminated categorical funding, um, including funds earmarked for arts education. So instead, money is distributed mostly in this base grant um, with additional supplemental funding provided to districts with high numbers of um, low-income foster youth and English language learners, um, so additional funding to help close the achievement gap. gap. Um, but the main thing is that instead of states deciding how school districts should spend their budgets, um, that's now decided locally. Um, and this really empowers local school board members to set locally driven priorities in partnership with their community members. Um, this also encourages transparency because school boards have to be really open and honest about their choices. Um, they have to let the, know, the community know where the money is going um, and explain what their intended results are. So their goals, direction, and budget are explained in something, or spelled out in something called a local control accountability plan, or an LCAP. Um, and that is a three-year plan that's updated annually. So the school district has to go through this decision-making planning process every year. Um, and they need to also host town hall public community meetings and get community input. Um, and so we stress that this is just a critical opportunity for community members and also arts advocates and whatever else you want to advocate for um, to speak up and support 
of what you want to see happen in your local school. Um, and officially, like under final rules adopted in the Ed Code, um, adopted by the State Board of Education, <coughs> students also have a right to be involved in a formal process in planning and budgeting for their district. Um, and that's where the Student Voices campaign comes in. Um, that's kind of hard to see. So although local districts have the power to decide how to spend their budgets, um, they have to invest in programs and services that meet these eight specific LCFF priorities. Um, they include a broad range of criteria, criteria um, that go beyond just measuring schools by the results of standardized tests. So it's nice that they include some of them are like parental involvement, um, school climate, student engagement. Um, so the Alliance also provides resources and tools um, like resources on how to make an effective school board presentation um, or examples based on research of how arts education helps meet these eight priorities and benefits student success. Um, we have an online LCFF toolkit that has all of that. I'm going to also link to that at the end of this presentation. Um, but to go back to the Student Voices campaign, I have another video on highlights from 2016, which was our most successful iteration of the campaign to date. Um, and I'm going to play that for you now. Today, we celebrate the collective voices of over 300 students who participated in the Student Voices campaign. And we have students and teachers and families from LA, Montana, Tulare County, Humboldt County, as well as from the Bay Area. In California, students are guaranteed a voice in planning and budgeting for their local school district. The Student Voices Campaign offers a creative way for students to make their voices heard in that process. The campaign invites students to create two-minute videos that capture their vision for their school and through the campaign, those videos are sent to their local school board. Today, we celebrate those voices and those visions. My name is Christopher Coppola. I am the head of the film department at the San Francisco Art Institute, and uh, I'm also a uh, councilman at the California Arts Council. And I helped to bring uh, <coughs> student voices to campus uh, to get high school students uh, involved in the arts and to see what we do here on campus. We live in a cinematic world. Uh, we live in a world where we communicate with video on the internet, and we take that often for granted. And it's very important for everybody around the world to be articulate uh, with the videos they put up. The more articulate it is, the more they think about it, uh, the stronger their voices uh, to make change in the world. Uh, in my video, I advocated for a gender-neutral restroom for trans and non-binary students at our school. The response from the local school board was great. Um, Susan Ellenberg emailed me right after I entered it, which was amazing. And she was trying to help, like really help us um, get the bathrooms. I was really excited to see the video. I actually hadn't heard about the issue uh, regarding the gender neutral bathrooms before seeing the video. But I was immediately impressed by the fact that students uh, took the time and effort to create a persuasive piece to advocate for something that they were interested in. And I was additionally impressed just by the quality of the video and how articulate the messaging was. I thought it was a great piece that deserved attention and investigation on that part. And the two gender neutral bathrooms actually were open this past Monday at our high school. I know how important the arts are to me, but other people who don't see the important people have to them. Arts is for everybody. It's not specifically one thing. It can be everything. The Student Voices Summit is something that you can build upon, something that you can take with you to your future, and you can build a career on. It's not just something that you're going to be done with that time. There is a student named Art in your classroom your school, your district. She can be the click of comprehension the moment you master the concept, as long as we give her the chance. Today, she writes of the world she would like to see tomorrow, a world that is colorful and warm, the perfect weather for anyone to bloom. So 
to touch a little bit more on what you saw in the video, um, last year we had participation from over 300 students um, from across seven different California counties. Um, to elaborate a little more on some of the impacts and success stories, the second place video that you saw there um, in San Jose, school leaders established gender neutral restrooms in response to a student voices campaign video that was submitted to them advocating for students who are transgender or non-binary um, and were just having trouble with the bathroom situation at the current bathroom situation at their school. Um, so that was really exciting. And then the first place video that you see, there was a clip of that in there, a student named Art, um, that was submitted to a school board in Delano. Um, and in response to that video, school leaders revamped some of their arts programs and also invited students to be part of the hiring process for new teachers. Um, and one of Anne's students' videos is also featured in that, the one with the um, the book opening, the sketchbook opening, which was also one of my favorites. Um, and she'll talk more about her students. Um, so, some of the benefits of undertaking this project in your classroom, it really provides a creative platform um, for students to have a say in the design of their education and how their school spends money, um, which affects them directly. Uh, so it helps, the project helps develop civic literacy. Um, they learn how to <coughs> participate beyond the classroom, like in this state process. Um, and then as a classroom project, the Student Voices Campaign is really rich in CTE and VAPA standards, um, and also promotes 21st century skills, um, things like collaboration, creative thinking, time management, um, problem solving, and it's a really great starting point to add video content into your curriculum. I'm gonna talk about the Classroom Guide next, which is a great resource for that. Um, and then lastly, it provides a great portfolio piece for your students to take with them beyond this project and into the future. Um, and there's also a travel opportunity, which I will get to later. Did this help? This, did this help uh, explain it a little more? The school is. I'm sorry. Yeah. No. Please. Because I know that even among teachers in my own cohort on my local site, they're kind of clueless, which is absurd because that's how the money gets distributed. Mm -hmm. So we get a big boatload of money, and all the categorical labels have been stripped off of a lot of it. And theoretically, we as faculty and our students and the parents get to say this is how we want the money spent in order to give our kids this type of education. And this is worth it to get, um, get well versed in what that LCAP process is and then kind of check your district to see where's your, you know, uh, where are the access points for you to have input mm -hmm. and where are the access points for your students to have impact. Because I've been to several meetings community meetings where the community's been invited to have input and I've sat there with five people. Never a student. Until I started telling the students to go and told other teachers to tell students to go. So this is a powerful avenue to bring your students' voices into it. Even if you don't make a video. Like you get them the heck in the right. room. And I just wanted to point out before we went into nuts and bolts, which are in their fabulous nuts and bolts, and it's, it's totally, um, in, it's one of the most important things right now for those of us in this field to know how that funding structure works and to know how to get involved in it. Because it, literally, it was all figured out so that every voice would matter. And this is a good way to learn about it because the alliance has, has broken it down pretty easily. So. Thank you so much, and no, that was great. <laughs> yeah, but also just why, why advocacy is so important because if yeah. you if you don't advocate, who will? Like, just someone needs to come to those meetings. <laughs> um, 
So we released this year uh, the Student Voices Campaign Classroom Guide. It's available for free download on studentvoicescampaign.org. Um, and the guide really allows teachers to use the campaign as an interdisciplinary service learning project. Um, there are elements of civic participation, community engagement, um, video production, and um, yeah, video and media production. Um, the guide uses uh, content standards for media arts as well as Common Core anchor standards. Um, and it's recommended for teachers Again, grades 7 to 12, but from any subject area, really. Um, lessons are designed to be scaled from as short as like periods of a few weeks to several months over the school year. Uh, there are different like areas of focus and activities to choose from. Um, there are six modules embedded throughout the guide, and so they're based on like research and analyzing advocacy and school funding, and then um, like developing a vision for your video, creating your video. Um, working with a team, like collaboration, um, planning, producing, and then like sh sharing your story. Um, so it's very flexible. Um, and there are a ton of like additional resources. There's an appendix with pre and post project surveys um, to get student feedback, um, as well as release forms if you are working with video, um, and then other templates you can use in your classroom. Um, the video production handbook has tech resources, um, shortcuts, tips, and other handouts. Um, so it's meant, the campaign overall is meant for students and teachers from any experience level. Um, we include tips for people who are absolute beginners. And um, I want to stress again that like the videos that we're looking for that are submitted do not have to be super professional or super slick with a ton of special effects. Um, instead, we focus on other criteria, like if the video is appropriate to its audience, um, has like a clear intent, a strong message and vision, does it meet the definition of being technically sound, um, is it creative, does it show unity, um, and you can do all that without having a ton of professional equipment. Um, and then lastly, there we also provide a LCFF Primer, which is an introduction to school funding policy that's written directly for students um, and then has activities and questions to um, really round out your lesson. So this guide was field tested last year in eight pilot classrooms across the state, like Northern Central and Southern California, and served as one of our pilot teachers. Um, and we gathered feedback from those groups and use that to revise the guide, the one that's currently available. Um, so it was used by middle and high school teachers. And we had media arts teachers use the guide, but we also had teachers um, like from English and theater who had had no previous video production experience. So it can be used there. Uh, the results that we received just like from field testing it um, the videos that we that were submitted from pilot classrooms in general were just of a higher caliber, like met those criteria better. They were had clearer messages. They were more technically sound. Um, and our pre and post project surveys also showed an overall 20% knowledge increase. And their greatest increase was in student knowledge about LCFF and their local school boards. Um, so I'm going to provide a link to where you can download this also at the end of this presentation. And lastly, um, we do have an event coming up. Um, it's the culminate, culminating event for the campaign, the Student Voices Summit and Screening. Um, this year it's going to take place in East Los Angeles at Plaza de la Raza on Saturday, April 29th. Um, so Students grades 7 to 12, as well as their teachers and family from all over the state are invited to attend. Um, and then for the event, we actually have a panel of judges that selects some finalist videos to be screened. Um, and then we have an award ceremony and award the, um, the top rated videos. Um, the day's also, it's a day long event from I think it's like 10.30 to 5. And it's also going to feature um, workshops on student advocacy as well as 
um, opportunities for students to explore the possibilities and practical steps of creative careers. So workshops with industry professionals as well as the creative careers panel and Q&A. Um, yeah, with people who work in the state's creative economy. Um, there's also going to be separate learning opportunities for teachers and adult, uh, teachers and parents who attend the event. Um, so something for everyone. So um, even if you're not able to have your students participate by this year's deadline, you're definitely still welcome um, to come with students. There's more info like at that Eventbrite link, Student Voices Summit 2017.eventbrite.com. And we also have travel stipends available for people who are traveling from farther locations, um, generously funded by the California Film Commission. Um, but applications to the travel stipend can also be found at that Eventbrite page. Um, and there's a flyer that is here. It was also in the folder when people signed out. So be sure to take materials and RSVP soon and come to our event. <laughs> um, so I have a few um, discussion questions just to break this up for you guys to talk either with a small group so you can talk with like a neighbor or like two people around you. Um, I just wanted to have you discuss a little like any previous experiences you may have had with student civic engagement or just like service learning projects in the classroom? Um, and then what were the benefits of doing something like that? And also what benefits do you see in possibly doing this in your classroom and how you can tie this project into other civic engagement pro projects? Does that make sense? Um, so we can give like, yeah, like a little over five minutes, I think. Oh, no. <laughs> All right, no, I'm still so sleepy too. So I'll I'll fill out the application. What What's cool is that another um, another thing I'm supposed to do jumped on my schedule last week, mm -hmm. and I'm supposed to actually be in San Diego. So I could, that won't be an issue then, I can launch right. on Friday, stop in LA and go on to San Diego, Yeah. send my kids home. Yeah. So I'll, e I'll email Sybil too and, and mm -hmm. we'll talk about it. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for the really, encouragement. Yeah, we really hope you can come. Thanks. It's, it's so essential to have highly rural people there. Yeah. And, and, and it's really great for my kids to, you know, kind of go, whoa. <laughs> Was that the first time they'd been to San Francisco? Um, some of them had been before, yeah, but one of them had never been. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time she'd seen any buildings taller than, like, eight or ten stories. Wow. So I, I had to keep, like, walking with her. She was, like, walking into fence guideposts and stuff like that. Like, no, no, no. No, there's a stop sign there. Like, move over. Watch where you're going. That was pretty rewarding. And to be on the campus, um, that oh, yeah. was amazing. Art Institute. Yeah. yeah. That view from the back balcony. Remember? That's got to be the best view in San Francisco. Yeah. Seriously. It's like, why do people go to Coit Tower? Or like right, because you anyone can just walk in. Yeah. yeah. Just, and I, you know, I've done that before because I, I went to CCA. So, but I'd forgotten. Mm -hmm. it's just a, it's amazing. <laughs> well, someone told me this is kind of related. If you look in Google Maps, sometimes they're like little green spaces that are not labeled exactly what they are. But if you go and explore like what they are, sometimes they end up being really cool like sitting areas right. that are just open to the public, but not anything official. Right. So I did that when I was in San Francisco last time. Like you're walking along the street, like oh, there's something here, and then we went, and there was like a little fountain and like a bench, and just a wonderful place to read. Right. But right. that was about it. Yeah. Yeah. There are rooftop gardens too, um, all in the main San Francisco area, mm -hmm. and you can find, you can search on that and find. I think there's like eight. They 
they highlight eight or ten. The seven by seven site does that. And it's the same thing. They're public. Yeah. They, you have to go in a building and go up. Right. So people don't do it. <laughs> it's well worth it. For sure. hotel room block again so we would cover for your students to stay overnight if it had to be super over. we most likely need okay. two nights to come in the day before right. and then leave the, the morning after yeah I think our block covers that so okay. definitely okay I'll touch base with you after super okay yeah. great they're all jogging for a position you know <laughs> and, my life, but we have a, a, a graduate of Del Arte School of Physical Theater mm -hmm. who's also part of Bollywood. He did all the voiceovers for Some Dog Millionaire and whatever. So he's teaching my students in Arcata Bollywood dance, and we're going to film it on the 29th. That's amazing. And, and so he just sends me a message like, so do you have Bollywood dance costumes in the room? <laughs> Let me check Actually, the back no, of my, we don't. Yeah. my closet. Yeah. in the trunk of my car. I don't, it's so great. That's so funny. <laughs> oh my god. And then he sends me eBay web links of where I can pick some up. <laughs> I mean, I thought Ar Arcado was the center of Bollywood. I don't know, right? Yeah. Evidently now we are, and we're having another um, one of Pratik's close friends who's from Mumbai is bringing 10 students from her, um, he, he's from um, Harare, Zimbabwe, so we're getting 10 girls from Zimbabwe coming in a couple weeks to do a device theater piece with us. <laughs> Just don't T don't tell them they need their bathing suits for where we are. No one's going in the water. Okay, so I think I'm going to bring everyone back. Um, hi. <laughs> Cool. So um, I'd really love to do like just a mini share out. Um, if anybody is like, I'd love to hear if anybody here has had previous experience with something like this or, or like a service learning project that you've done in the past. Yeah. Um, I was just telling these guys, this is the first year that we've had an arts media and entertainment program at uh, El Cajon Valley High School mm -hmm. here locally. And um, one of my friend's kids got cancer and they were putting on a, a cancer benefit and they said, we want to do like a fashion show, a fundraiser, you know, so it was perfect for my kids. We were doing like, uh, I was teaching them event production. So we brought a PA system and all the staging to make the, the runway and everything and put video screens up and it was a great 
um, opportunity not only for service learning but for that work-based learning project uh, for the kids. And I think it does get them, you know, kind of opening up their eyes to see the bigger picture a little bit, you know? Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, so that was just one thing that we did. Great. Great. We did a group lab 90 kids, so we had them break up in groups and do redesigning the classroom from their perspective, which is really similar to what you're talking about. Yeah. Like, what do we really want? Because I think as teachers and administrators, it's like this, we got, we got new furniture, what else would you want? Right, right. But it was really interesting to see from their perspective what they want in their classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and it was pretty free and open, but we had a component of doing Adobe Spark, so they had to do a presentation similar to this. Um, and then they presented it in front of a panel of one school board member, someone from OSHA to make sure you know, we can't have you know, flying desks, and, um, and then an uh, interior decorator, and then a person that's, that uh, does office space design. And so they had that, that kind of like, I have to show it to somebody, so it's not just my teachers, and they like me, and they know I'm good. So anyway, so that was really, it was really interesting for us as teachers to see their ideas and what they wanted in, what we thought they wanted, just a cool, you know, technologically sound classroom, but they want a lot of real simple comfort things there. Like they want, we want an area with snacks and a curing in our classroom. Why can't we have that? They all we all bring money, why can't we have good ideas? So anyway, it's the same idea of finding out from their perspective what they want and, and how we can make that happen. Okay, wonderful. Anybody else have a cool thing they do? I don't have a project that we've done, but I, as far as the benefits, I have, over the past few years of running my program, discovered that a lot of my students have a very difficult time advocating for themselves, mm -hmm. and this seems like an excellent um, medium for them to sort of, not necessarily hide behind, but a defined voice as a teacher about something that they're passionate about, even if it's something having to do with themselves, that they feel like, I would like this, but they would never speak out about it otherwise. In a group setting, in a project like this, to create something and then to have it go on and have uh, a beneficial outcome, mm -hmm. even just to know that someone is seeing it and reacting to it in any way, I feel would only empower them further, even again, if they never use their voice, they're using their voice in, in this medium and finding a powerful way to express themselves or advocate for themselves and others, and who knows what they could go on to do. Right. So it's, it's, a, it's, I'm excited to learn about it. Um, I, I like the opportunities that it has for critical thinking. Um, I'm an English teacher, so in my English classroom, one of the main things that we do is write persuasive essays. So this would be, I see this like us doing, you know, at the beginning of the school year next year as a jump, like a springboard into persuasive writing. We use that visual language and we're using the same kind of rubrics. Also, just to kind of demystify the processes that are going on in our yeah. everyday world, exactly, you know, it's yeah. like that is empowering in itself. Um, because the school board is a mic is a part of the city government, which is a part of the state and federal government. Mm -hmm. So, like to start where the students are with their own experience and demystify that process, and then make pieces that affect change, that like real change. Mm -hmm. And for to have them see that firsthand, I think, would be really powerful. And you'll see in our teacher's guide, we there is a Q&A for students on who your local school board members are um, and why they're in that position and the types of people that make up school boards, um, which is written directly for students. Great. So I think we're going to... Okay. Move on to Will Anne. you click? I didn't bring a picture yeah. for you. Did you still want to go through these slides or just the... Oh, we'll do it. I'll just okay. see. I, want to, I operate with a collective brain, and right. one of my favorite uh, parts of my brain, Johanna Morrow, did some slides for us last year, so they're still here. It's just like, yay. Um, so I'll use these and, and, and then go into the rest. I, I love the, what you said about... Um, both of you about uh, teaching kids how to decode and 
and advocate and I mean really we're, we're teaching kids how to enter that fourth estate you know and in this in this particular climate you know the the press and media is what's supposed to be the watchdog of what's happening in our governmental um, entities and processes and I'm ever being a child of the 60s in Chicago during the Democratic Unconvention I'm like okay time to gear up and this is a wonderful way to teach them how to um, be fully fledged members of that fourth estate. I run a school within a school for um, visual and performing arts. And it's just a little tiny pod in the middle of the school. But, well, I guess we're not anymore because we have like the biggest footprint on the campus because we just finished building a new performing arts center. And that was a bond. Our district had never floated a bond before. and. And we got it done, so I have a seven and a half million dollar building that sits there that's actually bigger than the gym. And yeah. right on. <laughs> and but don't get me wrong, I love my athletes. My athletes are the hardest, most well-disciplined members of our school. Um, we are behind the Redwood Curtain. We're geographically dispossessed from everywhere else. Anybody else rural here? <coughs> You're all urbanites. Well, your highways are kind of just as hard to get through, <laughs> I find, <laughs> as our mountains and um, streams and rivers and everything else. Um, it's, it's really important to establish community partners, and it's fun to have vehicles like these videos to, to you know, be a catalyst for the establishment of those. And if you want to go to the next slide, if you if you want to know more about our school, um, Johanna and I are talking about um, AAI later on today. Someone jacked my schedule, so I don't know what. what it, I think it's like the third. No, it's the first session of net of tomorrow. Yeah, so come by and and you'll you'll get um, a fuller story of what we are and especially what we are today. And with this particular, I remember talking with Sybil a couple of years ago now, or, or maybe it was just a, a year and a half ago, and really talking about student voices and what it could be, and LCFF had just come on the scene, like this is a match made in heaven. If we're gonna develop student voice, and we're gonna get the kids' input of what arts education should be in their schools, let's turn it into an advocacy thing. And that's born of the fact that we have um, a leadership program within our, my program, and we call them AAI ambassadors. It's very similar to COSA, where, where I proudly call ourselves a baby COSA because I studied at Chris Klung's feet and I still am. She isn't sick of me yet, so I continue to get mentored by um, your former fearless leader and founder of COSA. But our students, um, it, it's more than just a club. We have kids that get together on their own time and they run events, they, they're the face of the program out in the community. And they're not the, the whole group isn't involved in the video making process, but there's a lot of overlaps. This is the body that takes the, our videos to the school board. School board gets sent the videos, but we also get on the board agenda and they do a presentation and, and they speak personally to every board member, which is very powerful in any community. This is show the kids' faces. Let me go to the next. Um, it's a good fit for almost any program, whether it's an English program or it's a digital media program or you're just teaching oil painting or, what, or um, acting or tech theater or whatever, you can find an access point into it somehow. They can do they can do the whole thing on this if they want. Or they can figure out how to, to use the stable cameras a program like mine has. We don't actually buy video cameras anymore. We buy, um, we buy larger SLRs that can do video, HD video and stills because it, it, I don't have that much money so I might as well you know, sandwich it all together and it works sweet. It works really well and then we use whatever um, we can load up through Creative Cloud or um, we, we use iMovie or whatever. We have Mac Labs. Um, or if they want to, they can just load up apps on their phone and use that. 
the fun part for us is that I get exposure to experts in the field as part of our um, program design is that we have master classes so we bring artist experts in to teach with us in small intensives that last all semester. It's an extended day, the kids get a credit for doing more than just uh, the class. And so I always bring a video producer in to work with the kids. She's, she meets class in a, two hours to yeah, work with my kids who are working on these videos right now. She's got her bullwhip in hand, I'm sure, at this point in time, because April 1st is the deadline. And they, they learn from, from, I actually have two professionals that are working with them at this point in time, so I can step out. I mean, I don't, I'm the jack of all trades and master of almost none, except for creative coding and digital imaging. Um, with some graphic design thrown in there. So it, it's a great relief to them that they have someone who can go way deep in it. That's a good, so it's a good model to follow if you've got anyone, even if it, someone comes in for a day, let alone a, you know, a six week, eight week period of time. And, and then we also partner up with an organization in town that's made to, um, it's kind of a, a public access communication conduit for a lot of different types of um, filmmakers. Um, so this slide doesn't look like Melissa's because I just <coughs> she asked for my slides and I tossed it in and didn't look at her style. So this is on me that all of a sudden we switched it up. Um, for, for the kids, when they first come into the project, their goals are to learn how to make videos. Great. My goals are these. So I'm, my, my single most driving point is, is how do I lend my kids agency? How do I teach them how to advocate for themselves? On any level. I don't, I don't care what, you know, if their video it even makes it, to, you know. But if, if they just learn advocacy for themselves, great. And it's it's so important right now. I see a whole shift in my students' um, feeling of urgency to learn how to advocate for themselves. This is a really good concrete way for them to step that up. I mean, I have transgender kids and, um, and kids with disabilities, and, and they're, they're running scared right now because of the political climate. They don't know what, how the outside world is being shaped to react to them or whose medical um, needs are going to be met, or blah, blah, blah. And they want to be advocates. So right on. That, that I'll help teach them how to be advocates for anything. Let's start here. Let's start with a school where their parents are paying taxes. That school should be exactly what they feel they need right now. So um, I want to teach them how to develop their voices so they can implement. Um, and be um, catalysts for social change, how they can learn enough skills so they can um, flesh out a career. Um, youth development is, for me, just them learning how to be um, um, good presenters of this and, and ha have good self-esteem and learn how to talk. And most of the kids I deal with in, in my own classes are visual artists. And so they're like, Psh. yeah, I don't need to talk to anybody about what I'm doing. <laughs> like, actually, you probably should learn that. And so I move them into, into this. And then they go higher. They, they subcontract with their, um, the drama kids and the musicians to <laughs> actually do the work. But, yeah. and, and media literacy, how, how, can, how can they actually be media makers in a real sense, other than just learning how to use the software. You know, how can they be creative, innovative media makers and use that software, you know, flip it on its ear, do whatever they need to do so they get their own voice out there. And the only way they can do that is to learn how to decode and deconstruct and take it apart. And so we spend quite a bit of time on that. And then how many of you are, like, more than aware of the Common Core? standards. Well, you know, I started in on those conversations years ago and it went to I don't know how many professional development 
meetings where people are, you know, talking about, well, maybe they should be reading relevant texts and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, everything Common Core is about is what we have in our classes. Every single thing. This is what we've been doing. And finally, people can look to us to find the good model for it. Learning how to, to target an audience in this project teaches them that when they read any piece of literature, whether it's Huck Finn or Mouse or whatever, and they can think about what audience was that voice targeting. And that, that's part of the Common Core Standards, to figure out what, what's the audience for any piece of anything that they're reading, you know, whether it's a piece of music they're listening to, because read has a broader um, definition than just reading a page, that there is always a targeted audience. And that gives them the power to when they hear something or they catch something in their Instagram feed or whatever, to know if they're being targeted by someone else and go, okay, so that, hmm. Yeah. So it reinforces what they should be learning in their other academic classes and also what's hitting them from the outside world. Uh, let's see. I, I can't emphasize enough to the whole idea of them doing something to be published. Because we'll put, we put it out on our website, they take it on the road, and we're, we'll do even more with the projects we're doing this year. But for them, to, they're used to seeing stuff splatted out all over the net. This is their opportunity to do that same splat. And then actually go to a screening and be among other real professionals. I mean, when they met Coppola, they were just kind of like, oh, this is real. Like, yeah. That's why I told you not to wear your Uggs and your yoga pants here. Like, this is real. And those four kids walked back on our campus differently when they get, got back. One of those girls had never seen a building that was over eight stories tall before. You know, the, a couple of the other ones, their parents take them around. So they'd been there. But they'd never been there kind of on their own terms. Like this was them. It wasn't me. It's never about me. I'll provide the, the, the way for them to get there. And then I just, OK, make the most of it. And the guides that are available here are great. They're, they're like super dense with a lot of detail. And if you have never taught video production before, great. If you have before, great. You can just take this part and take this part and take this part. No one cares how much of it you use. Seriously. But it's all there as a fabulous resource. And that was a really good thing for for, um, for us to find. Um, the LCFF guide I have sent to my, uh, my faculty. Here, just read this part. And so that they know just flat out what's going on in our system better. So the writing and the tool sets are really well done. But even if you don't approach the project, download all this stuff and hit the resources. There's tons of resource links there. Yeah. Do you do you guys have any questions? Yeah. Yes. The question was Hi. saturation of like how did you choose those four kids? Because obviously if you're doing it with a class, everybody's gonna make one or a so kids. how do you get to that? It's I have a little bit of a different situation. I have well maybe not. Um I have scaffolded classes, I've got multi layered, so I have my first, second, and third years together in a class along with studio art. I tap dance really fast because that's how I get the program. And then I've got visual and media arts within the layer of all those. So when I extract my media arts kids for this, it's a smaller group. And then they I never have more than three teams and I tell them it's competitive, I'll take the leads. We do roles and responsibilities, break it down really clearly. And if their video you know, can, can get to a certain point, to the screening, I'll take those leads if you want to go. So it's competitive in that manner. So right from, they know that right from the beginning, there's jockeying for you know, who can be the lead. And I have fired leads before. 
and and and, and you know raised up another kid. <coughs> and and then it's it's a selection process. From there, we had three. We always have three groups. Um, maybe a lead is a senior. Like just rocked it with a video, but a senior and really isn't interested in going any farther with this. So I talked to the whole group. Okay, who is a younger person? Because I blend them. Yeah, in terms of first, second, third years, you know, who's really highly interested in this, highly capable? I asked the project lead for that group to recommend someone else from her, his or her team, and then that person goes, um, and then it kind of is up to me who I want to travel with. <laughs> they all know that too, so you know, any leverage I can get. Like, yeah, you want to cut school a bunch of times? Denied. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's all, all things are political too. Um, I have a question about the, like, the amount of, of videos to be produced and how long um, a unit like this would take. Like, how does it look like in a classroom? So it's going to be different in every single classroom. It, it can take as short or as long a time as you want. I should probably, full disclosure here, I loathe and despise video production. It is the bane of my existence because I like to stay in a conceptual creative challenge zone and this is so deep in nuts and bolts and details that it makes me crazy. So it, it, and that's just, so this project drags me back to video production every year and that's a good thing. But it's hard for me to teach. So we figure out a timeline, okay, I'll give this, we do six weeks. We'll give this project, no, this year we're giving it eight weeks. This month, I'm out of time, and then we're out. We're on to something else. I'm hiring someone else to teach it so that I can pay attention to AP because their portfolios are due real soon. And, and that's how I do it. There were English classes last year where they took like a whole semester or something. They, like right. they, they took and a it, chunk of time. It also depends on, you know, how big student teams are. We have videos submitted for that were, you know, created by maybe two or three students. We right. also had more elaborate videos created by a larger group of students. And um, the the one the winner um, wasn't didn't actually happen in a classroom. Had happened with Get Lit, which right? It's an after school, school organization. arts organization. So there are all sorts of models. I'm sure that Melissa could find for you something that's close to what you're doing, and she could say, oh, look at these, how these people did it. It also depends on if you want them to do, you know, some of the recording during class time, or you could have it as an assignment where they do it outside of class time and then bring back what they've recorded. So really flexible on so it's how, what, know, whatever how it shoe work, fits. Work best for you, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, where do you see the most common success? Because I'm, I was wondering if it was mostly from you know clubs and after school students <coughs> volunteering their own time because I worry a little bit about universal access, mm -hmm. especially for sites that don't have one-to-one -one devices. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we, all the students don't have the smartphone in order to record and you know, mess with the software, do you typically see more success from those extracurriculars? Or do you see more success coming from actual uh, curriculum courses? I'm just wondering. Um, what do you mean success? Like more uh, videos or better yeah, videos? Higher quality videos, videos that tend to be um, make it further in the process. Um, it's a range. Like we, the videos that came from pilot classrooms definitely were of a higher caliber, but we also had students who found us organically um, and did not do the project as part of a classroom assignment um, and submitted really great videos as well. Um, you should go to the website and look at the examples. There's a full and diverse range and the video the background context for those of, co yeah, of, of quality and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I mean, it kind of almost doesn't matter. I mean, it matters to me because I'm doing it in, during my class time. So I'm going to raise the bar pretty high. But I mean, it's, it's the content that yeah, matters. Yeah, I have to say, so the first place video, the director of, of that first place video, um, you know, ended up going to USC Film School. Right. He's a really talented director. 
and that one's a little more slick. But our second place video, the video advocating for gender neutral restrooms, was a very simple video that I think was just recorded on a cell phone, but because they had such a clear ask, um, that was one of the videos that made a direct impact on their, their school board. So it wasn't a, really about like the video production, um, but more about like their messaging and um, yeah, like what the message, what they were trying to get across. So we're at time. I just want to make sure that, it, that the, the Alliance is like so accessible. So they're the go-tos and, and ask them questions. Email me anytime you want, um, ask questions. I'm going to be talking about graphic design um, in the next session and it also has it in term with Matt um, Cawthron and it talks more about student voice, student advocacy and then um, do the demonstration site shtick um, next tomorrow at, at the first session. But um, even if you have conflicts, like pop into the think alike or better yet, come up to Arcata. See us <laughs> up in Arcata. And I just want to, um, if you haven't signed in, please sign in on both of these sheets. Um, and feel free to take as many flyers as you need. And thank like, you, Melissa, for coming in. Thank you so much, Anne.